Good evening, I'm Paul Hunter and this is The National. A fast growing tide of asylum seekers swamps officials at the border. It's forcing makeshift measures. So what's behind the surge? Unlike in the United States, you treat people as human beings. Census data reveals just how many millennials still live with mom or dad. Prairie heat puts thousands of homes at risk. Plus, investment and jobs for Canada as China ends its one-child policy. When you have millions and millions of babies. They come with fear, they come with hope. More than 4,000 asylum seekers have entered Canada this year through the United States. Back in the winter, we brought you lots of those stories from Manitoba, but over the course of the year, the momentum in migration has shifted to Quebec. There are now so many asylum seekers crossing the border from Vermont each day. Montreal has opened up Olympic Stadium just to put a roof over their heads. We'll get there in just a moment, but first, David Cochran takes us to the border crossing where officials are struggling to keep up. Monsieur, en bien français, English or French? Just minutes after we reach the border, the first asylum seeker arrives. Ten minutes later, another taxi, this time carrying a family. Over the next hour, three more taxis, a minivan and a shuttle bus. So you guys are under arrest for having crossed the border illegally, do you understand? The RCMP shout warnings, the migrants ignore them. For those who speak English, do you understand that you've crossed the border illegally? Yes? Okay. The whole point of this is to get arrested. To get into Canada's immigration system and out of the American one. They come from everywhere. Some of them quite young. Some of them traveling under great difficulty. But this latest surge is driven by Haitians who have been told by the U.S. government they could be deported within six months. What was a trickle is now a torrent of asylum seekers. The police here tell us it's been like this for weeks, an endless stream of taxis, buses and vans just dumping people at the border so they can be arrested and get into Canada. They stay here until there's enough people to fill up this bus and then they're taken away to detention and this starts all over again. Until a few weeks ago, this border crossing averaged just 30 people a day. The police tell us that on this day, nearly 300 people crossed and they only expect that to grow. What was a lonely dirt road is now a 24-7 processing center, complete with crowd control barriers and portable toilets. It continues through the night. Each person is questioned, processed and searched. Their luggage thrown into a truck. They're eventually taken away on the bus that is running on a load and go basis. Why don't you just quickly take off your jacket for me? An asylum assembly line. The endless cycle of arrivals, arrests, inspections, and relocations. From the border, they end up here, a makeshift RCMP detachment. Their numbers so large, many of them have to spend the night outside with only a tent canopy for shelter. Eventually, they'll be taken across the road to an immigration detention center that officials privately tell us is also bursting at the seams. Quietly, law enforcement and border officials say their facilities are being overwhelmed. Not enough space, not enough food, not enough beds. And already, that shuttle bus is heading back to the border where another round of drop-offs is happening. It's another wave, and the next one won't be far behind. David Cochran, CBC News, St. Bernard de la Côte, Quebec. I'm Alison Northcott in Montreal, where the influx of asylum seekers is pushing resources here to the limit as well. 
Montreal's Olympic Stadium is an iconic landmark, and today it also became a temporary shelter. A busload of asylum seekers arrived this morning, people lugging bags, adults and children. This man says he's originally from Haiti, but had been living in the U.S. until he walked across the border into Quebec last week. It feels good to be here in Canada, he says. The stadium is where he'll stay for now. Inside, 150 beds are laid out along with blankets and food, a temporary solution to deal with overwhelming demand. Canada Border Services says this recent wave of asylum seekers include people originally from Sudan, Turkey and Eritrea, but most are from Haiti. Since 2010, following the earthquake there, tens of thousands of Haitians have been allowed to stay in the U.S. under what's called temporary protective status. But the U.S. has signaled it may end that program in January. They are afraid that what is going on over in, in, in the United States and they know that the administration is not very sympathetic to their cause. So they say they are, you know, trying to, to, to seek somewhere else to live. I'm seeking a life. The political climate in the U.S. is what prompted Marie-Claude Celestin to come here. I found that Canada is was the best option for me and my family. Um, you guys understand humanitarian. Um, unlike in the United States, you treat people as human beings. Osnel Claribus left the U.S. afraid he'd be deported back to Haiti. He crossed the border illegally into Canada earlier this month. We need refuge, he says. Imagine our country is in a chaotic situation. Back at the stadium, Jean-Philippe Guillaume came to welcome the newcomers. I don't know nobody inside, but they're my family. I'm Haitian. We are Haitian, so we have to support each other. Quebec's immigration minister says despite the sudden influx, the province can handle it. And she's asked the federal government to speed up processing of this latest wave of asylum seekers so they can move out of shelters and into permanent housing. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Talks to renegotiate NAFTA begin in exactly two weeks. There's been much political jabbing over how to safeguard Canada's interests. Today, the Liberals announced who's going to be helping Team Canada. Some of the notable names on a 13-member advisory council include Conservatives Rana Ambrose and James Moore, NDP strategist Brian Topp, and National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations Perry Bellegarde. Tonight, CBC News has exclusive details about the government's plan of attack. Katie Simpson has more. Come September, Ottawa will ramp up its charm offensive with Washington. A government source tells me a couple of weeks after NAFTA renegotiations formally begin, ministers, parliamentary secretaries, MPs, even premiers and mayors will be called upon again to head south of the border to make the case to keep doing business with Canada. It will be very similar to what we saw during Donald Trump's first few months in office. But of course, the urgency will be heightened because trade talks will be underway. James Moore, a former Conservative cabinet minister who's on the new NAFTA council, says officials need to prepare for the worst since the U.S. president is on the hunt for a political win. We have to take President Trump and everything that he says, everything that comes from his administration literally and seriously, and be fully prepared for um, his most real threats about uh, tearing up NAFTA to be, to be taken seriously. Ottawa is in full-blown preparation mode for the talks. I'm told the Prime Minister is personally engaged with the file, but exactly what he's doing is unclear. This is being described as the most important issue the government is dealing with right now, since about one in five Canadian jobs depends on trade with the U.S. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. A familiar trade complaint from many southern neighbours, Canada's supply-managed dairy sector. But one country that has no problem with it, China. Supply management is one big reason a Chinese company is investing millions of dollars in Ontario. Janice McGregor explains. Andy Jackson's getting ready for a baby boom, not just in his barn, but half a world away in China, where millions of babies may soon be drinking formula made from his goat's milk at a factory a Chinese company is now building in eastern Ontario. No kidding. If they do in fact want 75 million litres, currently there's only roughly 52 million litres in all of Ontario produced now. That gives us immense growth possibility. Today, this looks like an empty field. 
But by 2019, Chinese dairy processor Feihe International will have a factory here, investing $225 million, employing hundreds of people, and making tens of thousands of tons of infant formula using milk from Canadian cows and goats, most of it bound for China. It's one of the largest economic development projects in our city's history. It's the largest investment uh, in Canada in agri-food from a foreign investor. And that was the number one thing that I got when I was over in China is the scale. When you have millions and millions of babies, you need to, build, you need to be able to manufacture a lot of infant baby formula. Here's why. China's one-child policy is phasing out, and only about a quarter of Chinese moms now breastfeed exclusively for the first six months. But many Chinese consumers don't trust milk from their own country. Nearly a decade ago, products like baby formula were found tainted with melamine. Hundreds of thousands got sick. Children died. And that's where the reputation of Canadian farms comes in. Helped along by the enthusiasm of Justin Trudeau's government for a closer relationship with China. And they had a choice to go to any country in the world, and they chose Canada because of the ability for us to supply the milk, and it's known to be one of the highest quality, safe, reliable milk. The dairy industry is under intense scrutiny right now, with Americans arguing that Canada's new milk pricing system is unfair. The U.S. is threatening a trade challenge, but Canadians say they're confident that these new baby formula exports will comply with all the rules. Janice McGregor, CBC News, Ottawa. Coming up, intruders court danger in Nova Scotia's abandoned mines. It's not thrill-seeking. This is something that will kill you. Plus, the city of Dunkirk cashes in on its movie moment. You can even pay to smell like Dunkirk. Canadian sprinter Andre de Grasse has pulled out of the upcoming World Championships in London. The Olympic medalist was injured Monday, suffering a strained hamstring. De Grasse was considered a top contender for at least three medals, and this would have been de Grasse's Last opportunity to oust track superstar Usain Bolt, who says he is running his final races. A major highway between British Columbia and Alberta closed this morning as a result of the ongoing B.C. wildfires. Highway 93 connects the Trans-Canada Highway to other major routes and runs through Kootenai National Park. This section was closed because of smoke and fires near the road. There are 130 fires still burning in the province, and around 6,000 people continue to be displaced from their homes. Southern Saskatchewan hasn't seen drought-like conditions like this for more than a century, so it should come as no surprise that it hasn't been good for crops or for farmers. Bonnie Allen tells us more. 50 kilometers south of Regina, it's so hot, so dry, that Bill Ollie's lentil crop is ready two weeks early. After 53 days without a drop of rain, the harvest is half the size it would normally be. The only reason it hasn't shriveled up entirely, says Ollie, last year was very wet. The roots have been able to keep accessing that and, and saved our crop. And uh, that's the benefit of the heavy clay is that it's got a lot of capacity to hold water. But his small hay crop won't be enough to feed his horses. It's a stressful summer for livestock producers. Water sources are drying up in pastures and the hay crop is half its normal size. It will be difficult and expensive to find feed to get animals through the winter. Regina had 11 days in July where temperatures soared above 30 degrees. And the city got less than two millimeters of rain the entire month compared to its usual 66 millimeters. This is probably the one I've had to do the most watering in ever. The one blessing, this gardener says, none of these guys. With no pools of stagnant water, there's no place for mosquitoes to breed. The city traps are basically empty. This week, we're averaging eight mosquitoes per trap, so we're phenomenally low. The most unexpected and dangerous impact is this. The dry conditions are causing the ground to shift so much, it's pulling wires from power meter boxes on houses, sparking six fires in two weeks. Thousands of homes are at risk. The forecast for August, still hot and dry. Ollie has never seen anything like it. 
this is the driest year and what do they say in 130 years so i haven't i'm old and i'm gray but i'm not quite that old yet any rain now would come too late to help his crop anyway bonnie allen cbc news near regina Far away from Saskatchewan, heat has been killing people by the thousands. Slow, horrific deaths, and scientists are predicting it will only get worse. Heat waves are a massive problem in South and Southeast Asian countries. But researchers say lives could still be saved. Christine Barak explains. It's a disturbing image, lives lost. Not to war or famine, but extreme heat. In 2015, one of the deadliest heat waves ever recorded killed more than 3,000 people in India and Pakistan. American researchers say their climate models predicted it. This is the tip of the iceberg in the sense that much more severe heat waves are coming. A study published today in the journal Science Advances shows if climate change continues on its current track, business as usual, humans won't be able to survive the humid heat in parts of South Asia by the year 2100. There'll be 40 million people currently who are living in India who won't be able to live there anymore. And what that means from a tangible perspective is think of Canada, there's 35 million people who live in Canada. It would be the Canadian equivalent of all of Canada freezing over and no one being able to live in Canada anymore. So how hot is too hot for human survival? Scientists don't use the same measurement that you see in a weather forecast. Instead, they use something called a wet bulb temperature. Simply put, it's the measure of heat stress in direct sunlight with high humidity. The fatal point for even a healthy person is 35 degrees Celsius for six hours. So far, it's never happened. During the 2015 heat wave in South Asia, experts say the wet bulb temperature was about 30. Doctors say once you stop sweating in that kind of heat, even shade won't help your body cope. You basically uh, dehydrate yourself from sweat, you reduce the circulation to the vital organs, and essentially you slowly cook the organs. Scientists also modeled moderate mitigation of climate change. If nations curb emissions in line with the Paris Climate Accord, the killer heat could be narrowly avoided. But experts say collective will, not science, will determine the final outcome. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the latest census data is out, and one aspect of it may come as a surprise to some. There are now more Canadians living alone and without children in their home. Just one of many trends changing this country's living landscape. Hannah Thibodeau explains. Maybe Bridget Jones doesn't want to live all by herself, but many Canadians do, especially women. I personally am very happy on my own, by myself, um, all by myself. Michelle Jamali Paquette has had her own place for 20 years. I've always found it difficult to, uh, to sort of share my space or to even come into somebody else's space and, and, and be truly comfortable. Data from the 2016 census shows that almost 30% of all Canadian households are people living alone. Compare that to the 1950s, when it was just over 7%. Historically, women depended on men, their spouses or partners, in order to be able to live and care for themselves. Now women are able to exercise their own freedom, their own, make their own choices. Women are also more likely to live alone because often they outlive their partners. Other reasons for the increase in single person households higher rates of divorce and separation. But on the flip side, some homes are becoming a bit more crowded. Most of my friends are living um, back at home with their parents. 22-year-old Emily Haduch may work in Toronto's financial district, but she lives in her parents' basement. There's a little less privacy, but at the same time, it's nice to be able to know that I'm financially growing to stabilize myself. Hadouch falls into the 35% of young adults between 20 and 34 living back at their parents' home, some returning after graduation. But data shows nearly 7 in 10 of them haven't even left home yet. 
the fastest growing type of household in the past five years, okay. multi-generational, meaning three or more generations under the same roof. And many new immigrants traditionally live this way. There's no longer a typical family. This has been a growing trend since the 1950s, and the next census, which will be released in 2021, is expected to show an ever-changing Canadian family life. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. One person is dead and another is reported missing after a natural gas explosion at a school in Minneapolis. The blast partially collapsed a building. The victim, a receptionist on campus, is said to have worked there for 17 years. Four more people had to be taken to hospital. A janitor at the school is still unaccounted for. After a disastrous week capped by the failure to eliminate Obamacare, Donald Trump is pushing forward with a campaign promise to take a harder line on immigration. Trump is endorsing a proposal to cut the number of legal immigrants in half over 10 years. As Stephen D'Souza reports, the bill is strongly influenced by Canada's merit-based point system. But we're going to stop it. Don't worry, we're building the wall. Don't worry. From a promise to build the wall... To cracking down at the border, Donald Trump has so far shown a narrow focus on illegal immigration. But now he's attached himself to a small piece of legal immigration reform that has some Canadian influence. The proposed new law would change who can get the much sought after green card, permanent residency in the U.S. This competitive application process will favor applicants who can speak English, financially support themselves and their families. Like Canada's, it would use a merit-based point system to attract highly skilled workers. Trump says it would limit unskilled immigrants who he claims take jobs and drive down wages. This legislation demonstrates our compassion for struggling American families who deserve an immigration system that puts their needs first and that puts America first. Every year we issue a million green cards. But a White House briefing on the bill got heated when a Trump advisor was challenged on whether the bill fundamentally changes the spirit of American immigration. The Statue of Liberty says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. It doesn't say anything about speaking English. It shows your cosmopolitan bias. And I just want to say... It sounds like you're trying to engineer the I just racial want to say, and ethnic flow of people into this country. The notion that you think that this is a racist bill is so wrong and so insulting. Critics say Trump is playing to voters in his base who fear immigrants are stealing their jobs. Experts say immigration creates more jobs and limiting who can come into the U.S. will end up helping countries like Canada. Canada's already recruiting um, you know, talent that's come from around the globe to the U.S. You know, this legislation is only going to strengthen Canada's hand. The proposed bill has actually been around since February, but after the recent defeat on health care reform, Trump may be looking for a legislative win. It won't be easy. The bill is already facing fierce opposition in Congress. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Washington. And the Trump administration reportedly may be reopening the volatile debate over race and college admissions, potentially targeting universities that discriminate against white applicants. According to a document leaked to the New York Times, the U.S. Justice Department may start looking at American colleges and universities for, quote, intentional race-based discrimination, meaning that schools with affirmative action policies could be investigated for civil rights violations. During its daily briefing, the White House downplayed the New York Times story, claiming it was based on uncorroborated sources. Moments after signing legislation imposing sanctions on Russia, Donald Trump blasted the bill for being, quote, seriously flawed and unconstitutional. Congress overwhelmingly approved the new law last week, giving it the power to stop any future moves by Trump to ease sanctions. Moscow quickly fired back, saying the bill amounted to a full-scale trade war and an end to any hopes for better relations with Washington. Straight ahead, how to make money off the movies the people of Dunkirk are finding out. It may be encouraging to see a green field instead of blowing dust and sand, but don't be fooled by it. Most farmers trying to forget how tough it was to farm last year say this year they're still paying the price. Are you going to find 
um, uh, Mr. Right, if you will, uh, in a bar, do you think? I think your Mr. Right is anywhere. And even with all those fans outside, there are another 50,000 fans inside the stadium ready to cheer on their World Series champions. However many Taliban there are out there, the idea is not to simply have Canadian forces roll in and get rid of them. Instead, it's to get the job done with Afghan forces. This is not a, a sports event, not like no team has just won the Super Bowl. This is a political event, and people are happier than I've ever seen them. They This was home to some of the most dramatic video taken the day the tsunami struck March 11th. Uh, the water basically just swept up and over the tsunami wall that sort of surrounds the harbor here. So you might guess for cicadas, it's a pretty intense time. And this is what it's all about. This is what they wait 17 years to do. One of these is a male, one of these is a female, and they're going at it. Truly, you don't really want to watch. It's kind of yucky. It's jammed tonight, full of people cheering at the end of everything Donald Trump says. This is his moment. It's the speech of his life. And he's painted a picture of a crime-ridden, scary country in the middle of a world that is in chaos, thanks to politicians of all stripes. Under him, not no more. <laughs> You know, Donald Trump is a big, important story and all that, but I don't know if I'll ever recover from seeing cicadas have sex. You know, it's like there's stuff you don't want to see in this world. Those are some examples of some of the stories I've done over the years here at CBC. Normally, I'm based in Washington covering Donald Trump. Uh, but tonight, of course, I'm hosting The National. And in the next break, we're here to take as many of your questions live about any of those stories, about Donald Trump, about anything you want. It doesn't have to be about Trump even though that's all anyone wants to talk about. Uh, we'll do that in the next break. To get your questions in, uh, put them in the comments section below, and we will see you in the next break. The call went out. We have to go to Dunkirk. Ready on the stern line. What are you doing? You know where we're going. Into war, George. I'll be useful, sir. It's a moment that was hailed as a miracle of deliverance by Winston Churchill when thousands of British civilians boarded small boats, crossed the English Channel, and helped evacuate more than 300,000 soldiers from the beaches of Dunkirk. Now, 77 years later, that moment has been captured in a blockbuster film. And as Thomas Daigle reports, it's motivating Brits and others to cross the Channel once again. It was in reality where the action took place in 40. And for the They've English, come to see it for themselves, a city and, uh, steeped in history, to, and just as importantly the for these tourists, the setting of a Hollywood hit. Even for first-time visitors, the beach looks familiar because Dunkirk the Place figures so prominently in Dunkirk the Movie, filmed right here. There are 400,000 men on this beach. The Christopher Nolan epic tells the real tale of Operation Dynamo, the rescue of nearly 340,000 British and French soldiers cornered by German forces and taken away on a makeshift flotilla of Navy ships, fishing boats and yachts. Tour guide Nicolas Idaziak grew up here but never felt as proud as he does now. It's a, a big blockbuster in Hollywood and uh, uh, now we are, uh, we are like stars. <laughs> Good news for a city in need of fresh business and whose economy long relied on just one thing, its port. The movie's production injected an estimated $13 million into the economy. Many of Dunkirk's 1,500 extras were local hires. Memories of the production on display throughout town, right next to pictures of the real events. The locals were very, very much involved. And, uh, well, I know that many people who already went to see the film for three or five times now. But beyond that, the blockbuster smash has meant a worldwide ad campaign for the small city with the same name. The local museum has doubled in size, and all those Second World War relics now see three times more visitors daily. These guys uh, laid the groundwork. 
that allowed my dad, for example, to come over to Britain from Canada and then embark on his exploits. John Patterson from Vancouver Long planned to visit Dunkirk, but most families here did not. We uh, saw the movie a couple of days ago and uh, we are interested in about where, where it all happened. Uh, we wanted to get spiritually ready for, for the movie, you know. Having seen the real place. Exactly. Hoping to bank on that newfound interest, the city has created Operation Dynamo merchandise like t-shirts, pens, and yes, even Dunkirk perfume, which apparently is made to smell like the spirit of Dunkirk. The city is banking on more traditional tourist attractions as well, like that walking tour focused on where the movie was filmed with some history mixed in. People here always knew the story. It took Hollywood for the rest of the world to listen. Thomas Dagler, CBC News, Dunkirk, France. <laughs> And if that inspires you to book a flight to France, our next story should give you some comfort. If your bag was oh. damaged, do you know what your rights would Not be? Not really, you know. This is a guy to ask. Something clearly happened. He's wow. Canada's unofficial airline watchdog, and he's already won battles on your behalf. Plus, he fought for online freedom in Syria. We remember the work of a cyber activist. Let's check today's business numbers. The TSX moved up 63 points. The dollar lost three-tenths of a cent. In New York, the Dow hit a record high again, finishing above 22,000, and the price of oil increased 43 cents. And we're back taking questions on Facebook. I was thinking it was the next break, so... We're, we're, I'm ready to go. You know, we did this a couple of nights ago, and I showed a... Can we take the high shot again, show you the studio? Because I was going to say one other thing. Sometimes they say, go to the big wall, Paul, for the, which we're going to do after this break for an intro. This is it over here. That's what they call it, the big wall. It's like it, you'll never get lost in this studio. <laughs> anyway, we've got a couple of uh, questions left over, I think, from the last time we did this. And as soon as I open up my thing... Uh, there was a question from, where did it go? Marissa D.T. Derry asks, uh, and for anyone watching, just put other questions in the comments and we'll get to as many as we can. How was the experience reporting the Boston Marathon bombing in Boston? Um, it was pretty brutal, right? We, we got there the next day, I think, and when, remember the manhunt was on for the, for the uh, bombers, or, you know, and it was just... It was freaky because everybody knew they were out there, and it was like, plus everybody was dealing with what had happened uh, at the end of the race that day. We ended up, a couple of things come to mind. We all know how it worked out. And uh, after the, uh, the one brother got killed and the other guy got found in the, in the boat, right, and there was the shootout on that street, well, we went back to that street the next day. Uh, and we did a piece called, uh, I think it happened on Laurel Street or something. That's where the shootout was, and the one brother ran over the other brother. And I'm telling you, everybody else was at the hospital where the brother that had been caught was, and we were like the only journalists on this street. And there were bullet holes everywhere, like in the sides of tree trunks. There was the blood on the, on the street, and all the people on that street, it was all white picket fences and things, were coming out as if it was like the, the day after the war ended. And they were all telling stories about the bombs that were going off and the, and the shootings and the stuff, and they were just like kind of hiding in their houses and looking out the windows, it was, it was weird talking to these people and just seeing all the bullet holes everywhere. Um, another thing that I remember is that we did a piece a year later, actually. We went back and we talked to people who had been affected, who, uh, first uh, responders, people who helped out, people who were hurt. Um, and we talked to a woman named Heather Abbott who had her, part of her leg blown off that day. And man, I get shivers just talking about it sometimes because... Like, the resilience in this woman was remarkable. Um, she had lost her leg, and she wanted to now turn what she had learned in the past year into motivational speaking to help other people who lost their legs through other reasons. Um, it was, it kind of, it was remarkable. Um, a, a lot of memories from the Boston uh, bombing. It was quite a week, uh, and then a year later to go back and revisit, it was, uh, it was something else. Um, what do we have here? One from tonight. 
Uh, Sarah Marshall asks, Paul, what did you study in university and uh, when did you start out in journalism? Well, I studied, I studied uh, journalism at Ryerson back when it was a polytechnical institute. Um, uh, I'm not going to say when, but it was in the 1980s. Uh, that I graduated. My first job, my first real job, TV job, was in a place called CKNX in Wingham, Ontario, north of London, Ontario. And it was a class, I preach this to journalism students today. Um, go to a place far away from Toronto where you can be terrible <laughs> and they still let you come back to work the next day and you'll learn. And I shot, you know, video, I edited, I assigned myself sometimes, I lined up, I anchored, I reported, and I did it again and again and again and again and I got better. You learn from your mistakes, and you also learn about living in other parts of the country. If you're going to ultimately, I believe, be a network journalist reporting to all Canadians, get out there, work in other parts of the country that are not your comfort zone. Learn, uh, you know, I went to Saskatoon after that, and I've lived in various parts of the country. Um, and, and I think it's made me a better journalist because I've come to, I don't know, learn about the country where I live. and. Summer is golden on the CBC Sports. Come on, y'all, it's time to rise up. You can't keep, like, over 300 people in a plane with, like, no AC, running out of food, running out of water. Like, you can't just do that when it's hot. Like, it's just not right. That tone may be very familiar to you, either from our story last night about hundreds of passengers stranded on the tarmac in Ottawa, or from your own frustration at the hands of an airline. So let's meet the quiet hero who's in your corner. Gabor Lukacs has waged war again and again to make sure airlines treat you right, and he's done it in his spare time. Tom Murphy spent some time with the air traveler's best friend. Here's another look at his story. I enjoy to see uh, Justice Prevail for sure. Canada, you probably don't know him, but every time you set foot in an airport, this guy could be your new best friend. So, so this happened during your last flight now? That's right. He has your back, or your bag, damaged as it may be. Has it ripped before? Are you going to report it to... They don't realize it yet, but this couple at Halifax's International Airport just got rescued by the number one advocate for airline passengers. Something clearly happened while... A man whose very name, Gabor Lukacs, sends a chill through the veins of hardened airline executives all across North America. I should tell you, this gentleman here is a passenger airline, an airline passenger rights advocate. We'll get back to the bag in a minute. This is equal to 7,760 and 7552. You're probably wondering who is this Superman of the friendly skies? Well, most days he's a mild mannered math professor. The uh, mathematician calls his wife and says, Honey, it's three really terrible, but one box is missing. That's by day. By night, he's a kind of superhero fighting for you. Okay, maybe not the kind with a cape, but you get the idea. It's not a calling that I think so somebody selected me for something. I'm, no, no, it's not, not a calling of that sort. It's just really listening to the most basic moral imperative, help your fellow humans. A lesson he learned at a young age when he had a front row seat in a courtroom drama. Later, at just 16, Gabor, a child math prodigy, moved from Israel to Canada to start his PhD at York University. Yes, PhD at age 16. When his studies brought him to Dalhousie University in Halifax, he says he found his home. And then, on a trip to an academic conference, United Airlines cancelled his flight, and his life as an advocate took off. I missed the conference on account of one airline's misconduct and its lack of training of, of its staff, and it's simply not caring about what will be the consequences of the flight cancellation and of not reprotecting passengers afterwards. Gabor, who is not a lawyer, took United to court and won. That was just the beginning. It wasn't like one day I got up in the morning and decided that I am going to be a passenger rights advocate. It's more that I know that by now I know a lot about this area and that passengers, unfortunately, have no one else to go to. Here you go. 
take Gabor on a domestic airlines flight, and the spoils he has won for passengers are all around him. So get this, you get bumped off an oversold domestic flight and delayed six hours? Thank you know who. Your compensation will now be increased to 800 bucks. And yeah, thanks to Gabor, if Air Canada damages your bag, they pay. Valuables in your suitcase go missing on a WestJet flight, they'll write you a check. And if the airline completely loses your luggage, the liability limit has gone up almost 10 times to $2,000. All thanks to this quiet mathematician turned airlines passenger rights champion and one of the biggest pains in the airline industry's derriere. Do you think they find you annoying? Well, I'm sure they do. Uh, at least some people. It, it, it's a question of whom you ask. Um, if, if you look at people from, from uh, Canjet, I would say that they would be, their experience was quite different than in Air Canada. Their experience was that I was willing to actually spend a whole afternoon of my time to give a workshop for their, their legal team about how air passenger rights work, what the issues are, what they need to pay attention to. Annoying? Well, we talked to one airline executive whose airline is not even off the ground. Well, Gabor is incredibly passionate and he's driven. And guess what? Jim Scott of Canada Jetlines admitted he's already consulted with Gabor. And he usually has the upper hand with both the moral argument and the legal argument, and he will not take no for an answer. So do you think that people are, are learning about their rights? I don't think so. And um, still, no here in the air travel world he has helped transform, he might as well be invisible. Do you think people around here know who you are? Probably. Know what you've done for them? Probably not. I'm wondering if you recognize this man here. Don't recognize him, no. You don't recognize him? No. He probably has done more for airline passenger rights in this country. He's fought cases up to some of the highest courts in the land. Really? If your bag was oh. damaged, do you know what your rights would not be? Not really, you know. This is the guy to ask. Oh, okay. <laughs> Gabor Lukacs has countless court challenges against the airlines to his name. He's taken on the Canadian Transportation Agency, which regulates the airline industry 27 times, winning all but three cases. Come on, even seasoned lawyers would be proud of a record like that. Gabor does it in his spare time, in the living room of his Halifax home. People here on his street, unaware an airline passenger rights champion, is among them. Let's get, take a couple of pictures. And then Which brings us back to that battered bag. A real life example of something Gabor fought for and okay, won. Actually, since you were traveling internationally, um, your rights are governed by the Montreal Convention. Mm -hmm. Under section, article 1772, the airline is liable for damage to your baggage. I would be happy to walk over with you to your can and they need to take a report and they will have to pay for the repair of your baggage. They break your bag, they replace it. Even airline lawyers admit few know the rules better than Gabor. This gentleman had his baggage actually uh, damaged during his international flights. We're here to complete a baggage regulatory report. Okay. We'll take it up with Air Canada's baggage department. Thank you very much, sir. See you. Right. What did you think of uh, Gabor Lukacs' help here? That was brilliant because uh, uh, I wasn't even thinking about going and fighting it out with Air Canada. Make sure that you document everything and um, if you're into any trouble, you know where to find me. How noble, how moral. You're very welcome. On second thought, maybe he should have a cape. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. Next up, a Syrian cyber activist took enormous risks to keep his country's culture alive. Today, we learned he was killed for his efforts. Under the instruction of the Bank of Canada, Two Ottawa firms do most of the processing of currency. Two years ago, it was decided to bring out Canadian Elizabethan dollars. The product of the work that began then will be seen this week when the new bills come into use. Oh, just get some uh, open here to give to the tellers. The new bills look a little strange at first. A more mature Queen Elizabeth is on the front. Robins claim territory on the back. The bills are more detailed, more colorful. The bold numbers make it easier for visually impaired people to use. But visually, they don't appeal to everyone. I don't like them. It's ugly. That's 
Why should we change? Canada's new $1 coins came tumbling off the mint's money presses today, and some people are already calling them loonies. They're made of nickel, copper, and recycled old tin cans. They're gold-colored, and they have 11 sides. Last fall, a courier service lost the original design of a voyageur, so it was switched to a loon swimming on a lake. It's coming, the latest addition to Canada's coin collection. Here's a sample token of the new bimetal coin, nickel on the outside with an aluminum bronze center. Now all they have to figure out is what design to put in the middle. There's no shortage of ideas. At the Canadian Mint, there are 19,000 of them. This design embodies the strength and the determination of Canadians from coast to coast. The new bills are smooth, almost slick, with clear windows. And they won't care yeah, easily. I told you. There's a great future, the Bank of Canada says, in bills that feel like plastic. These new banknotes are a 21st century achievement in which all Canadians can take pride and in which all Canadians can place their confidence. When the banks open this week, you'll find the latest symbol of Canada's age of development, the new Canadian dollar. Basil Cardibal was a Syrian fighter who didn't use a gun. As a cyber activist, he helped people thwart online censorship and evade surveillance by the Assad regime. Today, his wife revealed that he is dead, executed by the Syrian government nearly two years ago. Earlier this year, Susan Ormiston showed us a project Cardibal launched to preserve and share Syria's ancient cultural heritage. Tonight, as he's mourned as a hero, we thought we'd show you his work once again. Hidden treasure. Inside, a model inspired by the past but constructed for the future. This main column piece uh, we could probably do in, I want to say about 40 hours. A symbol of what's at risk far from here in the Syrian desert at Palmyra. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, an ancient city which once stood at the crossroads of several civilizations. The first century architecture prized for Greek, Roman and Persian influences. One year ago, we came here with Syrian and Russian forces, saw for ourselves the monuments, threatened and some damaged by fanatical ISIS fighters. We recorded the status of Palmyra as of early May 2016. A temple destroyed, a victory arch shattered, but much of Palmyra is still intact, including the tetrapylons, a set of four, four-column structures which marked an intersection. Today, according to satellite photographs, two of the tetrapylons are completely destroyed, gone forever. As ISIS invaded Syria, they took the town of Palmyra, murdered its chief archaeologist, and destroyed many of the buildings in a UNESCO heritage site. And you'll have the opportunity to step over to the model and see it up close. 
Brian Merkley runs Creative Commons, a nonprofit organization devoted to sharing creative content on the internet. He and hashtag New Palmyra decided to bring back parts of the ruins using 3D modeling. Over hundreds of hours, they helped create a new tetrapylon using a 3D printing company out of Texas. A model made of plastic, not stone, smaller and lighter than the original, not archaeologically exact, a reproduction. It is a new Palmyra and it's telling new stories on top of the old one. Um, so I think that's incredibly powerful and it's not the way we think about heritage. We usually focus on recreating or replicating it flawlessly. We don't think of it as something that, is, that also belongs to us that we can remix and build upon. This model was in part designed from photographic 3D imaging taken by Syrian Basil Kartabil as far back as 2005. Kartabil, a software developer, pried open the internet in his home country arguing for free open content. He was a blogging pioneer until open access became a threat. We don't know where he is. John and Phillips, a friend, last saw him in 2011. So he was a very well-known person in the government and also in the community and technology communities. So yes, he was known and, and many times I, I, I've heard him, he was given um, options. Do you want to work on this project or do you want to go to jail? In 2012, Cartable was scooped up in Damascus and thrown in jail. The Free Basel movement has been pressing for his release, but in the last two years, they've heard nothing from him, nothing about him. They fear he might be dead. So open knowledge is political, and for some people it's dangerous. And just seeing it here and having worked on it for five months with these, uh, these folks to bring it to life, it's, it's an emotional moment. Palmyra has become a powerful symbol at the center of a seesaw battle for control. In May 2015, ISIS first overran the desert town. Syrian forces recaptured it in March 2016, celebrating with a concert earning praise for saving Palmyra, only to lose it again nine months later as ISIS battled back in December 2016. Destruction began again. Modeling the monuments keeps the past accessible, according to Barry Through, director of Hashtag New Palmyra. The power of this digital reproduction is that, you know, the, the people that want to control the cultural identity of the region can't control um, what's online, what's free, what's shared. Um, and so by sharing this cultural heritage as widely as possible and with as many as pe people as possible, um, it allows a, 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 a sense of hope. Palmyra is a strategic and cultural battlefield, deeply vulnerable still. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Toronto. Straight ahead, abandoned mines are filled with hazards, but try telling that to some people. I'm Laura Lynch. They call him the Pazar, or the Master of Disaster. Lawyer Ken Feinberg negotiated compensation for the victims of some of the U.S.'s most tragic events. He's on the next edition of The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. I greet you as your queen. I am proud to contemplate the great heritage of this nation. But I'm more proud to contemplate the spirit and ideas which brought this country to nation. The weather has been so beautiful that fortunately the Queen has been able to drive in an open yeah, car. I'm just wondering what her reaction is going to be to that enormous cake, Adrian. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, let's all sing together Happy Birthday to Canada! Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, stepping out into the Arctic air for the first time. In moments it became clear that this would be a royal tour with a difference. Since the crowds were naturally smaller, formality began to ease, 
and the royal family responded to the unaffected warmth and curiosity of the crowds. In Yorkton, a visiting American rock band was warming the crowd up. Tour officials were a little worried they'd still be warming them up when the Queen arrived, but they finished seconds before the motorcade pulled in. But while an ethnic dance was underway, something did go wrong. No one had remembered to roll out the red carpet. So while the Queen watched, the carpet was rolled out, then smoothed out, and then finally cut out because it was too long. In the afternoon, there was time for some colorful entertainment of all kinds. Prince Philip seemed to enjoy it, and the Queen, well, she seemed a little puzzled. The Queen has been on the road for a week. She's covered thousands of kilometers, yet every day she manages to look fresh, seems genuinely happy to see people, and today was no exception. It was pretty much the best day of my life. Oh yeah, I saw the Queen for 10 seconds. She asked me a question, I just touched her, I don't know why. She asked me from where I was from, and she shook my hand. We just love that. We just love that. put a sign on the front of my head. I spoke to the Queen. I think it's fantastic. It's what we need. When we leave tomorrow, we shall all take away unforgettable memories of this vast and challenging territory and of its people. Not something you see every day, especially up close. Some scientists were out tagging great white sharks when this happened. And the camera survived <laughs> to tell the tale. By the way, so did the scientists. For thrill-seeking explorers, part of the draw is going to places you're not supposed to go. And for a group of Nova Scotians, that means heading into abandoned mines. But do they understand what dangers lurk in those dark depths? David Burke has our story. This may very well be uh, the longest mine in Nova Scotia. This YouTube video shows the so-called Nova Scotia mine hunters in their element, making their way through another abandoned mine, par for the course for a group of men who seek adventure by exploring Nova Scotia's discarded mines. They've hit about 20 so far, even though it often means trespassing on private property. The mine hunters keep their identities secret, digitally blurring their faces and altering their voices on the videos they share. Bob Birchall is one of thousands who have viewed them, and what he sees disturbs him. It's not thrill-seeking because it's, uh, this is something that will kill you. He says there are hundreds of ways an old mine could turn deadly. Cave-ins, falls, contaminated mine water, and poisonous gas are just a few. There's countless dangers working in an operating mine, a little alone going in one that's been abandoned for years and, and not having any experience and not knowing what you're doing. It's, it's, uh, it's a ticket for uh, disaster. The province's Department of Natural Resources wants the mine hunters to stop immediately. I couldn't believe what I was watching. Some, some of the videos are, are just, what these guys are doing underground are incredibly risky. Hennick says about a quarter of the province's 8,000 abandoned mines are on Crown land, many way off the beaten path. The province has blocked the openings to several of those mines and is working on sealing the others. For those on private land, owners are required to post warning signs and block open holes. But the mine hunters are undeterred. Members of the group told CBC News that they actually believe the risks are quite small. They say the adventure of the mines makes it more than worth it. They say they take all necessary precautions and do extensive research before they go into any mine and have no plans to stop doing it. David Burke, CBC News, Halifax. 22,219 solo public engagements. And with that, tonight, 
Prince Philip is retired from official duty. His final event on his own was held outside Buckingham Palace today. Prince Philip is 96 years old and apparently does plan to attend some public events going forward, but with the Queen. And that's The National for this Wednesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to cbcnews.ca. I'm Paul Hunter. Good night.